Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. This is Nighthawk calling. Alex, come on, tell us who we've got today. Excited today. This is something I want to know more about. Uh, we have with us today Chris Skidmore, who is uh, formerly the university's minister, current member of parliament for Kingswood, but also the author of several book history books. Now, Alina, one of them is about Edward the Sixth. Are we sure it's Edward the Sixth? Yeah, Chris, the background is last week she claimed that Edward the Sixth was the son of George V. I was trying to tell her about Edward the Eighth. Would you mind giving her like a 15 second brief on why <laughs> Edward the Sixth doesn't belong in the 20th century? Yeah, no, Edward the Sixth definitely, I think, is uh, someone firmly in the 16th century. Uh, he wouldn't be too happy, I don't think, with the 20th century, the way it's turned out. I think sort of he would have much preferred remaining where he grew up in. Yeah, I think his health might have been better for it, but he'd be slightly baffled um, because he is actually Henry VIII's son, the one that he waited all those years for. But I will continue trying to hammer that into Alina as we go through these weeks on this podcast. We're actually here um, today to talk to you, Chris, about your latest book or the last book that you did about Richard III. Um, and it was called Prote- uh, Brother, Protector, King, wasn't it? That's right. Subtitles reflective of the fact that basically uh, everyone thinks of Richard III, um, you know, as this sort of controversial king. But he was only king for about 788 days. Um, and, you know, most of his life he was a loyal brother. And then he moved on to becoming a protector when his own brother, Edward IV, died. But then obviously he decided to take the throne for himself. So the, the book is sort of written in these three sections, like reflecting uh, his, his lives. Actually, the, the initial book was called The Lives of Richard III, but we thought that might be a bit confusing. So that's why we took these different stages. I really like it. Um, Richard III has been well covered, hasn't he? And not just since they found him under a car park. Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at history, and I'm sure, you know, you've had historians on who probably talked about this, you know, there is a market out there for certain figures. Um, and there's been plenty of books on uh, Richard III, probably one a year, if not more than that. Um, part of the problem, though, is when you look at Richard, uh, there are many people who find him a very sort of enigmatic uh, figure, some to the extent that you know, he can't do anything wrong. Um, sort of the sort of individual you know, people who sort of would uh, say that the king has been sort of hard done by through history. And, you know, there is a case for that, but there's certainly not a case for going all the way to the other side. And what you do get is a large number of uh, what they call Ricardian publications. So sort of partial accounts of, of, of the king that look to just sort of completely present a, a one-sided account of uh, Richard being, you know, n- not involved in the prince's uh, disappearance in 1483, that uh, he was a sort of innocent king. And uh, that's not really what history is about. And that's certainly not the history that I write. Um, and what I find quite frustrating with Richard III is all sort of professional historians don't really want to touch Richard, because if you do, if you wanted to present, say, authoritative uh factual account using the records the contemporary records then you're likely to probably be slated by that group now you know i'm a tory mp i'm quite got a thick skin so i thought well i'll have a go at sort of a uh going after richard and trying to present a historical account because there haven't been that many of these you know impartial accounts out of all the flood of publications in in recent years so why is now the right time for a new biography of richard iii so, well, I think you probably remember back in 20, August 2012, when they sort of dug the king's body up out of the car park in uh, in Leicester. Um, I was actually writing another book on the Battle of Bosworth at the time, and uh, I remember turning on BBC News and seeing this sort of flashing up sort of breaking news banner. And the lady, Philippa Langley, I remember getting in contact with me, asking if I'd like to help, and I replied back to her saying she wasn't my constituent and I wouldn't be able to sort of get involved, which is what... Uh, Is that your nice way of saying back back. away, crazy lady? Yeah, well, I mean, it (laughs) turned out to be, you know, I lost out there pretty badly in terms of, you know, if if it was a bet. But uh, uh, in all seriousness, that whole episode of of the king and then where he should be buried, whether it was going to be in in York where he grew up or whether it was in Leicester, it just made me sort of feel that, you know, there's still that mania around Richard III, but it's got to be sort of properly historically based in, in the records and, you know, trying to present a new account, you know, 
also using the information about how, how he died, because actually when you look at his, his, the wounds that is on his skeleton, the, the little cut marks and stuff, it's really fascinating about sort of final, his final moments. Um, but that basically was something which I decided, well, I'll have a go. I'm a Tudor historian by background, as you mentioned. I did this book about Bosworth, the Battle of Bosworth and the rise of the Tudors. And I realised you couldn't really tell the story of the Tudors without also looking at the downfall of Richard III. And I thought, well, I can't really find a book that is authoritative and also impartial, so I'm going to have to write it. Fair enough. Uh, so let's get into the difference a bit between the man and the myth. Um, the problem starts even before Shakespeare, doesn't it? Who is John? Is it Rouse? Um, there are problems with some of the early sources, aren't there? Yeah, and, uh, yeah correct pronunciation. John Rouse um, is, a, is a monk who lives up in Warwickshire, um, and he's connected uh, to a chapel chantry that's uh, uh, to do with Anne uh, Neville, who's Richard's wife. And so he it's quite sort of disconnected from all other sort of historical sources, which is quite useful, but it's an example of how history is then written by the winners. So in 1483, when Richard's just come to the throne, he then does this big tour around the country called a progress. He visits uh, Warwick and Warwickshire, uh, Warwick Castle, um, where Anne Neville grew up. And uh, John Rouse presents this lovely sort of uh, uh, illustrated uh, scroll, um, which does survive, actually, uh, called the Rouse Roll. And uh, in it, there's some nice pictures of Richard and Anne and all their ancestors. And he calls Richard a most mighty prince. Um, and then two years later, maybe three years later, after Richard's been killed at the Battle of Bosworth, uh, John Rouse decides to write a history of the kings of England, in which he then talks about how actually Richard was effectively Antichrist, um, and that he sort of spent two years growing up in his mother's womb and had sort of fangs and te- long teeth and had long hair when he came out of the womb. And it was just completely over the top. Uh, but then he also produces another role uh, where he erases the mention of Richard being a mighty prince and just talks about him being Anne's husband. And that's, for me, completely indicative of, of early historians having to sort of do you know, massive U-turns, almost sort of like politicians. Um, and so, you know, Rouse decides, having sort of tried to curry favour with Richard, to sort of go all out to try to then go and curry favour with, with Henry VII. You know, and uh, um, it just goes to show you can't necessarily trust those early sources. Coming back to Shakespeare, as Alex mentioned before, Shakespeare then really goes to town on him, doesn't he? Yeah, and then that's the thing. Everyone thinks with Richard III, uh, because of the play, you know, a horse, a horse, a kingdom for my horse. And some of those lines are so memorable and they've really stuck, you know, in the uh, consciousness of of, of the British public and our history. But obviously a lot of those lines are both fictional. So when you look at the Battle of Bosworth, actually some of the accounts of what Richard did at the battle, he actually is offered a horse to escape and he turns around and says, no, I don't want a horse. This day I will... Um, die a king, uh, I will either be crowned a king or die on the battlefield and um, shuns a horse. Um, but what's really interesting about Shakespeare is he, he uses these sources, which are sort of Tudor chronicles, and you can sort of like peeling back the skin on an onion, get back to seeing where some of his uh, stories come from. So Shakespeare's main sources, Holland's Hedge Chronicles, which come from Edward Hall's Chronicles, which come from Polydor Virgil, uh, who was sort of the first Tudor historian. Um, and they get sort of added to and uh, ex- you know, exaggerated at every time that te- the telling is taking place. Um, but we, you know, we know that the Shakespeare, the Shakespearean version of Richard III is completely as, of a dramatic uh, quality. Uh, if anything, like portray sort of Robert Cecil uh, at the time is a lot of Shakespeare's plays, as we know, were obviously sort of there, there was contemporary resonances that we've sometimes, you know, about like when, you know, Elizabeth I watched Richard II and she sort of turned to someone in the audience and said, oh, this is all about me. And I think we forget that sometimes with contemporary parallels um, and Robert Cecil himself was disabled and sort of the the, the hunchback element of, of, of Richard we know now that he had a scoliosis we can see that from the curve in the in the spine you know, of that skeleton that was discovered in the car park of this sort of hunchback is completely over the top um, and uh, you know ultimately that is what has remained in the public imagination but it's it's completely false one but Shakespeare wasn't the only one that trashed him. It carried on, didn't it? Um, who was William Hutton? 
So, yeah, what you get then is you begin to have over the centuries some people who begin to um, sort of continue this sort of you know, real sort of vitriolic hatred of, of Richard. Um, and obviously partly that's potentially to do with he seen as a tyrant who just sort of takes power and sees it and abuses it. Uh, William Hutton uh, is one of my sort of favourite early historians. He's an 18th century historian who uh, writes the first account of the Battle of Bosworth. And actually, he's probably the first person who says, well, actually, Richard could also be bad as well as good. Um, and previously, it's been sort of black and white. So Hutton sort of comes along and says, well, you know, actually, within our human sort of uh, make up you know we're capable of both um and that's i think probably what i myself come down on when i look at sort of the how we judge richard is is, is to recognize it's not necessarily black or white it's not necessarily good or evil it's potentially a bit of both and understanding the contemporary nature of a, a king and their reign through the going back to the original sources is really what you've got to do as a historian there were also people defending richard in the 18th century Am I right? Yeah, there were some people who were sort of defending him. Um, and there's some really quite, there's some interesting characters who, who do that. There's like Horace Walpole, um, who basically writes a defence of Richard III. Um, and he, he does so to sort of basically, he, he goes back through a couple of the early records and recognises that Richard is actually sort of, you know, not entirely evil, that he's sort of spending sort of money on gifts for poor people and for sort of widows and sort of, you know, yeah, he sort of sees a, a different side to the, the king as well. And there's a guy called William Cornwallis as well, who uh, publishes an, sort of an encomium of Richard III, um, which he claims is a sort of manuscript that, from the 15th century. It, it actually turned out to be a um, sort of a forgery. Um, but yeah, it seems like around the sort of 18th century period, maybe a sort of time of the Enlightenment, I guess, it's sort of a revisiting of old knowledge and sort of people re, sort of re-questioning sort of those those existing orthodoxies, I guess. So give us, um, I would love to have a contemporary view of Richard from someone who met him um, that you found. Who was Nicholas von Poplau? Yeah, so Nicholas von Poplau is probably the only absolutely contemporary uh, description of Richard III we have during his reign. Uh, and Nicholas von Poplau was a, a Silesian knight, so he's from sort of like eastern area of Germany. And he he comes over to, to England in 1484, around sort of early May time. Uh, and he travels up and he, he, he makes a diary, um, which actually um, I got translated from the original um, German by a historian friend of mine, uh, Hans Kleinecke, who was very kindly sort of you know translated it fully out of the German for the first time. And I use that as the sort of way into my book to sort of you know understand you know where 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 is Richard in, in the sort of contemporary residence of everything. And uh, Poplau goes and visits Richard in his court, and Richard's up near York at Pontefract. And uh, what you see is this sort of image of a king who's sort of really welcoming. I mean, he's quite blingy. I mean, he's, he's Popalow talks about he's got these sort of pearls and rings and, and the pearls are the size of peas and how he's sort of trying to give Popalow loads of, 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 of jewellery and, and, and gold. And Popalow tries to refuse and Richard gets angry. Um, and he Popalow has dinner with him and... Uh, um, Richard talks about how he wishes he could sort of go and fight the Turks because he's quite militaristic. So you really get a sense from sort of Poplau's journal of, of, of sort of part of Richard's character. And he actually talks about how Richard has a great heart. Um, he talks about how Richard's three cent, three fingers taller than him, which isn't much use because we don't know how tall Poplau is, but sort of uh, <laughs> slender bones. Um, and he he actually mentions he thinks that the princes haven't died and they've been locked up somewhere in a tower, which is sort of quite interesting. Um, which a lot of people have jumped on that line. But you know, for me, that it just goes to show that sort of there for those contemporaries and for someone who was coming over with no agenda either. You know, he'd just gone come from Germany, come went back to Germany and then sort of wrote up this journal uh, without thinking about sort of the need to sort of please any sort of future sort of uh, dynasties like the Tudors. Um, it suggests that sort of, you know, Richard as a man in his own time, you know, was appreciated by people. 
I think it does, but you also point just, out, don't you, that um, you've got uh, that's a scenario where Richard has set out to impress. Um, but one shadow that has hung over him for centuries, you've mentioned it already, is the fate of his nephews, Edward and Richard. Um, it's not nice, um, but I don't think it's unique to hold your rifles, uh, rivals as part of a move to consolidate power at this point in time. And I know it's a huge can of worms, but where do you stand on this? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, when you look at either side of Richard's reigns, you've got two examples of two kings who who did quite similar the things. So you've got Henry the Seventh, who holds uh, Edward, Earl of Warwick, who, without sort of getting through the sort of dynastic sort of complications of this, is probably the next in line to the Yorkist dynasty. And Henry locks him up in a tower for about. 14 years before eventually executing him. Um, and on the other side, uh, Edward IV's reign in 1470, um, after the battles of Barnet and battles of Tewkesbury, um, 1471, sorry, um, Edward IV ends up sort of, you know, having locked Henry VI up in the tower. Henry VI is then discovered dead and potentially having been murdered there. Um, so it, it happens in other reigns and it's obviously a, a, a contemporary uh, part of the, the job, I guess, in politics at the time, uh, rather be here than there than now. Um, but obviously the mystery of the princes is, is so compelling because we can't ever really know either way, you know, what exactly happened to them. And again, it's a question of the sources because a lot of the sources we have to use to sort of say, well, what might have happened to them or then written sort of 10 to 15 years after the event. Um, and, what I think happened, though, is, is that when you look at after Richard becomes king, I mean, what's really interesting is that people don't seem to mind Richard becoming king and actually quite welcome a bit of stability, uh, given sort of Richard's you know, had a highly successful military career and sort of quite a stable character, or people at least thought he was. Um, and then there seems to be an, a, an attempt to free the princes in the tower uh, in July 1483, which seems to go wrong. Um, and then while Richard is sort of out, outside of the capital in London, um, a rebellion then is raised against Richard. And for me, the single sort of most important factor is that people aren't rebelling to put the princes, to put Edward V back on the throne. They're then rebelling to put Henry Tudor, who's this sort of uh, 28 year old guy in exile in Brittany on the throne. And it seems to suggest that then these people who are rebelling against Richard must know something that the princes are dead. Otherwise, why would they choose Henry Tudor as their their candidate? And, you know, it just seems to me that when you start sort of dotting the dots and crossing the T's, whatever sort of a, you, you begin to see that there must have been around sort of early August that maybe somebody uh, decided to dispatch the princes. And if, if you would, you know, put me on the spot, I'd probably say... Uh, the Duke of Buckingham, who was one of Henry's accomplices, goes back into London. And a couple of contemporary sources, including one that was discovered in about 1980, talk about the death of the princes by the Vies, the V-I-S-E, maybe like what we think, advice of the, of the Duke of Buckingham. And so Buckingham then actually tries to rebel against Richard, but my theory is that he realised there was a rebellion going on, he probably decided to jump ship, knowing how thick he was in it uh, when it came to the princess's disappearance um you know there's a whole saga i'd probably love to write about this at one stage but i thought you know try to sort of focus on the on the key sort of reigns and the characters um but you know henry the seventh's reign is is completely overshadowed by this guy called perkin warbeck who then claims that he's the younger prince in the tower richard duke of york and you know what's really interesting in an age you know, where we're, we're seeing sort of disinformation being shared on on twitter around the coronavirus is the the level to which you have disinformation circulating and rumour and gossip and people want to believe sometimes the survival and the princes and there's a sort of something in the medieval psyche that sort of really you know grips this and sees these these people as beyond pretenders and sort of Lazarus like they come back from the dead. Um, and you've got to try and step away from that mentality and get back to try to sort of see well what's the most likely scenario. Um, but I do think, you know, we know they're dead now, but sort of yeah. <laughs> Probably, I think, yeah, that summer around early August 1483. So one thing that strikes me, people talk about him seizing the throne, but they forget how loyal he truly was to his brother for years. He fought for him in the War of the Roses, and he fought for him in the War of the Roses, didn't he? And to get his hands on the crown, people must have really supported him at the time. No? 
Yeah, I mean, that, you're absolutely right. I think when you look at Richard, uh, he died at the age of, I think, about 32 and a half. Um, so, you know, everyone thinks of sort of uh, Laurence Olivier style, sort of king in his 50s or something, but it's not true. And uh, um, for most of his life, and he was pretty much politically active from about the age of 16, um, he he was a loyal brother and his, his own brother Edward the Fourth had become king at eighteen, and Richard supported him right from the start. And uh, he has to go into exile with Edward the Fourth as well after sort of uh, George, Duke of Clarence, his other brother, decides to rebel against them with the Edward, of, oh, sorry, um, the Earl of Warwick. Um, and Richard's always there, and actually he becomes a sort of key part of the king's strategy when dealing with Scotland. He bases himself up in the north, becomes sort of king of the north, as it were, um, and. It, that's what's so unfathomable about Richard is then, well, you know, if he has this sort of, and he, one of his mottos is loyalty me lie, which sort of you know, he took, he's, he's reflective of the fact that he really puts sort of you know, a, a, a standard on loyalty. Um, is then why does he decide having backed his brother, backed the Yorkist dynasty to throw it all away in this sort of you know, period where he decides then to become king himself? Um, and, and, and that's what part of the sort of enigma that I, you know, I try to wrestle with in the book, because I think it's that process going from brother to protector to king, which is obviously the defining moment in Richard's life. But the brother part of it is so huge, because that's why a lot of people support Richard taking the throne, because he's been such a, a stalwart of, of the Yorkist uh, regime for so long. I think what you've done is try and strip this down to remove centuries of controversy um, and and opposing factions and start from scratch um that's what i see in your book what kind of king did you discover i mean so, admittedly I think, he's only got two years but what yeah would you i mean it's, it, i mean it's difficult with you know with those sort of two years because then half, half the time he's just sort of then fighting against sort of henry tudor preparing to to invade uh and so yeah he's just thinking well where, where's the invasion coming from and sort of yeah with all these military preparations as a result um but you can get a sense of, of of the real Richard from a number of different sources. And, you know, as a historian, you know, one of the things I love to do is sort of, you know, go back to the original sources. There's, you know, what I find amazing is that people say, where do you find, where do you look? And obviously the National Archives in Kew, you've just got sort of the, these, these loose documents that you go through and you sort of see the warrants for what the king's spending money on. Um, and you can then piece these together. They've obviously got dates to them. So sometimes you can think, well, actually he, he gave that money to a poor widow on that particular day when he was moving from here to there. And so you, using those written sources, um, you, you get a sense of a king who um, is very pious um, and he spends a lot of money on churches and on chantries. Uh, you get a sense of a king who is really interested in warfare still, so he spends a lot of money on sort of artillery and weaponry and, uh, you know, he's hunting on hawks and uh, um, a, a king who's, I think, you, what's interesting, I think, with, with Richard is he, as a younger brother, you know, never was going to be potentially the king. And it's a bit like what happened with Henry VIII. As a result, he receives a probably quite a good clerical education with the potential of maybe going, you know, off to become a cleric maybe and as a result he's highly he's he's well read and so we've got a number of his books that survive where he's written his name in so we can understand what he was reading as well um and obviously we've got a lot of his sort of his prayer book for example which survives because he took it to the ballad bosworth and then it got stolen and it handed over into the sort of a, a hands of the tudors so um I think sort of, you know, he's, he's certainly a highly intelligent, uh, well-read, cultured individual um, who also uh, is always looking out for his, his salvation in the future. Question. <clears throat> Slightly off topic, but he was, Richard III was married. Um, why didn't he have any kids? So he had one kid, um, but basically he died. Uh, and to Edward of Middleham. Uh, and he, we're not quite sure when he was born, but he probably about 1476. And then he died in April 1484. And that's one of the other things with Richard's reign. It's like this downward spiral because he gets his his uh, only child to be, and, and the question is why do they have more children as well? Because you know, usually given uh, child mortality rates in medieval times, you want you know, 
I think Edward the Fourth had you know, five or six children, and certainly Ed, uh, Richard was one of eight. I think initially, uh, when Cecily Neville, his mother, gave birth to them, was through Richard Duke of York. Um, but Edward the Middleton dies. He seems to be quite sickly, and then so therefore Richard has no heir, and then his wife then dies as well, and Neville uh, in March 1485. So it's you know this by the time it comes to the Battle of Bosworth, Richard's not, you know not got a wife, he's not got an heir, it's not looking great, and he's he's scouting around for potentially new wives in Portugal to marry. Um, but yeah, it's quite a tragic tale, really. I think. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, why why did he not have more children? Uh, given that you know it might have been a high probability that you would lose a child. I mean, I suppose I feel it's sorry for him. Yeah, it is terrible, isn't it? Yeah, it just seems it goes all wrong, really, for Richard. I mean, that's the problem. He's, having gone so well for him for most of his life, he made the right judgment calls all the way up to about 30, and maybe he had some sort of, like, equivalent of a midlife crisis. And, but, um, you yeah, know, it just seems that his decision then to uh, remove the princes, I mean, initially, I, I think people backed it. And I, but it's just whether, you know, they, they wanted to believe then that the, Edward V was cast as illegitimate through... Uh, a rather complex uh, mechanism by which Richard said, oh, actually, Edward IV, his brother, had actually been married to and betrothed to another lady, and the Talbot, and as a result, his marriage was invalid, and therefore the princes were illegitimate. People seem to have believed that, or wanted to believe it, because then they were quite happy for Richard to become king. It's, it's once, he, once the, sort of, the news got out that the princes were dead, uh, the, the, that, that's when, in medieval times, if you kill children, you're seen as a tyrant because you're seen as being sort of the equivalent of Herod. And if you kill children, you can do anything. And that seems to be the sort of the line in the sand that people, you can't cross. Um, and after that, there's, as a big rebellion takes place. Richard is successful at defeating that rebellion, but all the people who rebel then flee uh, across the, the channel to Brittany to join Henry Tudor. And he has to basically police most of the southern England with his northern followers. And, and you know, it's a, a lesson in politics is that if you want to if you want to be a successful leader or successful sort of, a, you've got to have this one nation strategy of being able to bring the whole country with you. And Richard can't because he, all he can do is sort of uh, use his northern followers to sort of uh, prop up prop up the south, and that sort of leaves people more aggrieved. And uh, yeah, it just it just goes then suddenly all the way downhill very rapidly. And it's unfortunate because I mean he is only thirty two, isn't he, when he dies? So he potentially had the, all the time in front of him in the world to to have another wife and have heirs. Um, but Bosworth cut him off. Um, what do you think is the single most valuable piece of evidence that you discovered to dispel dispel these age old preconceptions of Richard the Third? Oh, a difficult question. This because I was thinking there's so many documents that other people have found. So I don't want to take credit for like sort of saying, well, I found this one when someone else did um, <laughs> yeah, all right which one did you like the most even if you weren't the first person to lay your hands on it well, there, was, there was one i did find which got a bit of coverage at the time got me a bit of hot water because there was um at the time there was the debate around whether richard should be buried in york or leicester and then i found in the national archives a document in the duchy of lancaster records so he basically was a request that he, he had this big foundation to build a college of, of priests at, at york a yeah. hundred priests to his name. And I found this document which basically said that on the 2nd of March, 1485, he said that we want, he wanted the, the, the priests to be paid their wages, seeing by their prayers, we trust to be made more acceptable to God and his saints. Um, and we will and straightly charge that you do content and pay the officials. Um, but basically that then got picked up by the Daily Mail that then suddenly, oh, it demonstrates that Richard wanted to be buried in York. I didn't necessarily think it, it but what I was what was interesting there is that that's only about two weeks before his wife dies and he's clearly thinking about his own mortality and, and it's that ability to pick up a document and say, well, when was it written? Look at the date on it and try to reference it with sort of what might be going on contemporary. We know his wife was probably dying of tuberculosis. So he probably made that request to, the, to have those priests paid because he thought, actually... My wife's dying, you know, I'm potentially on the way out myself. I want to make sure that my own salvation's covered. I better make sure that people are praying for me and being paid. Otherwise, they might have some kind of unionized strike and, you know, stop doing so. Um, so ultimately, I sort of thought that might be a nice example of something actually I did discover rather than pick on something that somebody else found. Mm. Um, but, you know, ultimately, um, the 
what I try to do with my books is sort of say, well, these are all the contemporary sources that we can find. Let's weave them together using the sort of narrative process. Um, I'm trying to think of other things I, I like that sort of, uh, you know, you get with Richard. Um, I guess sort of, you know, using the Poplar account as well, of having that translated out of the original German by my friend, you know, brought out a couple of other bits of, of uh, Richard's personality through sort of the eyes of, of a contemporary uh, and that, I think, is what it's all got to be about, is, is using the original sources to to highlight the sort of almost the then and now uh, as it was seen at the time. What surprised me were the three stages you mentioned. Brother Protector King, he accelerated through those in 88 days. He can't have had that much time to scheme. Yeah, I think for me, it, 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 what must have been going through Richard's mind when he had to take decisions on uh, at such a rapid pace? So he, he goes from being a sort of loyal brother. His, his, so Edward the Fourth dies on the 9th of April, fourteen eighty three, and by the sixth of July, that same year, uh, Richard's been crowned Richard the Third. Now, did he know on the 9th of April was that his master plan to then think, become Richard the Third, or was he reacting at pace to events? And I think. For me, having been a politician for 10 years, it's always more cock up than conspiracy. And I think what you see with uh, in Richard's sort of for those 88 days is a number of massive cock ups uh, where Richard thinks he's doing the right thing, takes a decision uh, and then realises that he can't go back and then has to move on to the next stage. And he's upset too many people. And then what I tried, I referred to it was like you go into a, like a maze and then the door closes behind you and you can't get back again. And you see this with, with Richard. He basically works out, he finds out that actually his his brother, Edward IV, has, has made a change to his will and requested that Richard becomes the king's protector because Edward V uh, is about 13 years old, so he's not old enough to reign. So Richard's determined that he will become the protector and not the uh, king's uh, mother's side of the family, the Woodvilles. And so he goes out to town, rests the Woodvilles and plots against them and seizes uh, Anthony Rivers, who's the king's sort of governor, uh, who's a Woodville. And then he realises that actually when he meets Edward V, he's been hanging around with the Woodvilles for the past sort of three, four years, and isn't particularly happy that Richard's arrested them all uh, and thrown them into prison. And so Richard then realises that even though he's becoming protector, what he once the king's then been crowned as Edward V, that maybe the king will then seek revenge against him. And actually he realises that a lot of the Yorkist supporters are quite happy for Edward V to be uh, king without having a protector. So he then has to desperately work out a way in which he can remain protector. And then I think he realises that it's not going to be possible. Um, And then they have to come up with a a mechanism by which to disinherit Edward V uh, in order to keep the Woodvilles off the throne. And what's really interesting is there's enough members of the nobility that are quite happy to acquiesce and go along with Richard's plan. But it's quite haphazard and it is not sort of predestined. It's not sort of Machiavellian, um, even though we see Richard as a Machiavellian prince. I think he, he he's lucky to get away with it. Um, and he does so eventually because he's sort of forced to, because his mistakes have led him to do so. I think um, what you've tried to do, obviously, like we said, is strip it back and start again, if you like. Um, and judging by the rave reviews you've had from uh, Dan Jones, David Starkey, Helen Castor, uh, Leander DeLisle, John Guy, the list goes on and on and on. Um, you've certainly succeeded. Um, tell everyone again what your book is called and how they can get hold of it. Yeah, so um, it, Richard the Third, Brother Protector King uh, by Chris Skidmore. It was um, published um, 2017, you get paid back uh, as well. Um, what's the site that for the independent booksellers? I can't remember what that's called now. You can go, uh, but uh, you, know, you can get it in all good bookshops if you were allowed to. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's on Amazon, but also go on that other site that allows you for your independent bookseller to, to, uh, uh, to purchase it for you. What Chris is saying is don't go to Amazon because authors get ripped off. <laughs> well, I, I don't mind if it's a sales or sale, I guess, but I do like to see, see I want to make sure the independents get their uh, ability to, to stay afloat because they are so, so important. Um, Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for joining us not at all it's been great speaking to you both thank you for your time this weekend is absolutely cracking on history hack 
Join us tonight down the pub in our virtual boozer, the Mary Rose, for what is a comprehensive, highly entertaining and actually quite scholarly debate um, on the most iconic British battle of all time. Uh, We had representatives from the National Army Museum, the Museum of the Royal Navy. We had Claire Mully rejoin us to argue um, for a battle in World War Two. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, And you will be a bit surprised by the winner. Perhaps. I know I was. We have for you tomorrow morning to commemorate Anzac Day an interview with Matt McClacken of Matt McClacken's Living History about Gallipoli and Australian identity with, of course, a mention of the New Zealanders as well. Then we have an interview with Bethany Hughes. Um, We thought that you all needed a bit of love and something a bit nicer to talk about than uh, coronavirus and doom and gloom. So we're talking to her about Venus and Aphrodite and then... On Sunday, we have the big one. We recorded this last night and had an absolute blast with Yoan Griffith and Jamie Bamber um, for more than two hours talking about Hornblower, what it's meant to them in their careers, all the fun they had filming, all the challenges. Um, It's just full of great stuff and we can't wait to share it with you. Uh, don't forget you can now become a patron of history hack we would like to keep going after this uh, crisis is over and you can pledge your support for as little as a dollar a month to help us do that you just need to go to historyhack.podbean.com there now follows a public service announcement i'm horatia hornblower and i'm archie kennedy the simplest gift you can give in these troubled times is to obey orders indeed the regulations are very clear in the matter It is the duty of all of us to remain at anchor until the little people in the talking box signal you otherwise. You don't want to end up getting flogged. Good day to you. Good day to you.